Hey, hey, everybody. Pastor John here. How you doing? Welcome on in. Going to wait for uh, a few of you to log on. Miss Sharon MacArthur, how are you doing tonight? You're the first one here. Christina, I see you too, honey. I'm going to try to pull this up where I can see your comments tonight. You guys hear me okay out there? All right. Give it a second here. Let everybody log on. Hope you're having a great Tuesday today. It is April the 7th. And another day in the books. Got a few of you coming on there. Good to see everybody logging in. All right, Miss Sharon, you're the first comment. Glad to see that you and Brother Bud are doing well. Miss you guys. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right, everybody. Hope you're having a great day. This is Pastor John with our Tuesday night Bible study from Bible Baptist Church in Howell, Michigan. So hopefully a bunch of our church family will be, will be seeing this and uh, I'm sure a number of our friends around the country as well. We are thinking of you all and praying for you guys just the same. Uh, I was just looking at a statistic here a moment ago, just a uh, uh, number of sources confirm that there's about 18,970 um, coronavirus cases here in the state of Michigan. And uh, so we're, we're up there. Uh, there is a couple people in our own church that have faced this. I know most of our church family would know the Ron Parker family. I just had a chance to speak with them and pray with them uh, here earlier this week and uh, continue to lift them up in your prayers uh, as they are coming through this uh, battle with the virus about 20 days in for their family. Thankful to the Lord that he has uh, sustained them through it. And uh, they're still fighting, but seem to be on the uh, upward trending uh, side of it. So anyway, uh, all right, guys, I'm kind of stalling for a minute, but it looks like we've got a good group on. Rebecca Combs, hello to you. All right, well, um, we've uh, done these studies now for a few weeks since we've not been able to gather as a church family uh, in person. And though we miss uh, each and every one of you dearly, we also are thankful to come to you by way of uh, Facebook Live. Uh, and I just wanna mention a few things that we're doing during this special week, the Passion Week, the Easter Week. What a week for those of us who are uh, sons and daughters of God, those who have accepted Christ into our life. This is the week that we celebrate uh, his entrance into Jerusalem, culminating ultimately in his sacrificial death on the cross to redeem the souls of all men. Uh, and so what a week it is. This Sunday is Easter Sunday, April the 12th. We want to encourage you to join us uh, at Bible Baptist Church of Howell. You can go to howellchurch.org slash live, howellchurch.org slash live. It's forward slash live. Uh, and our services will be there this week at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then at 1230, there's something very special for the kids uh, a junior church program with Mr. Jeff, and that's been really exciting. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, go over to the church Facebook page at BBC Howell, and uh, some of that, uh, some of those uh, recordings that Mr. Jeff has done are there, and I know my kids have thoroughly enjoyed them. So let me encourage you, join us this Sunday, uh, 9 a.m., 11 a.m. If you go to the church Facebook page, there's an invitation there, uh, just a JPEG that you can download. And we encourage you just to share that out on your page. We want to try to get as many people as possible just tuned into the broadcast, not just so that we can uh, gather an audience, but so that they can clearly hear the message of the gospel um, that will be shared uh, just plain as day. Uh, also some inspiring worship as we think about our resurrected Savior and King, Jesus Christ. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, if you're a part of our BBC family, Pastor Tim's doing uh, kind of a special seven days of Easter uh, program this week, and you've probably got an email about that. Uh, so I encourage you to be a part of that. And then as well, um, he is uh, 
taking us through the various um, details of the Passion Week. Um, if you tune into the Facebook page here at 10 p.m. Uh, each night this week, all the way up till Saturday night, uh, you can catch that as well. So a uh, lot going on. I'm trying to connect with you as best we can and looking forward to seeing you all in person. Well, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed this time that we've shared together. Over the last few weeks, my heart has just been burdened um, uh, that we not waste this opportunity. And you, th- you might think, wow, that's an interesting word to use, Pastor John. But really, this opportunity that lay before us in the midst of this coronavirus uh, season, and you might call it uh, a trial or a storm or a time of adversity, certainly for the world, for our country, and for our families. And a couple weeks ago, I just encouraged you from First Kings chapter 19, as Elijah was there on the mountain, and uh, there was wind, and there was fire, and there was a lot of loud things, but that wasn't the way that God was connecting to him and speaking into his situation. It was through the still, small voice. And so we talked about the importance of us in this loud, fearful time, finding that place where we can hear from God, where, where he can speak peace into our life, but also where he can speak clarity, and he can speak uh, assurance into uh, our situation. And so uh, I hope that you've had some time. I know many of you probably have had more time than usual. I hope that you've had some time to uh, hear from the Lord. Uh, last week, we talked about some of the ways that he does connect with us. How does that happen? Do we just walk outside and look up into the sky and he just uh, speaks to us with a loud, audible voice? And he's done that various times throughout Scripture. But we saw last week that he speaks to us some, through some unique ways, through his written word and as we connect with him in prayer and also a way of his indwelling spirit. Talked about how God uses the circumstances of our lives and also those that are around us, that the people that he's put into our lives uh, to speak to us as well. Uh, and so I hope that you've discerned and perhaps seen and heard the Lord speaking to you through one or more of those avenues over the last few days as I have. Uh, but I want to speak to you tonight, just kind of wrap up this, this topic about the voice of God tonight and then next week we'll, t- we'll talk about something entirely different. Um, I want to kind of wrap this up for those of you who might be out there and you're thinking, okay, so I know it's important that my heart receive uh, the calming strength that can only be provided through the still small voice of God. And, you know, I, I heard you out, Pastor John, about some of those ways that the Lord can connect with me. But if I'm going to just be honest, I, I, I sometimes just wonder if God is really there because I, I, it's so rare that I hear him speaking to me. Um, I want to speak to you tonight who maybe find that as your circumstance. I want to encourage you, no matter if you regularly through your uh, devotional life and by way of his spirit speaking to you, if you regularly hear from the Lord, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, But even to those of you that don't, I want to remind you what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 41. The prophet here says, Fear thou not, and he's speaking for God, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. What's encouraging about that verse to me is I often view my relationship with God through an inaccurate lens. And I feel like the role that perhaps I have and the part that I play has so much to do with whether or not God wants to be near me or wants to speak to me or desires to have relationship and fellowship with me. And that is just not the case. The fact is that we have a promise that God will be with us And that his hand will uphold us, not based upon our own righteousness, our own performance, our own consistency, but rather upon his promise that he is upholding us by his righteousness. That really encouraged me. So whether or not you feel that God is there, I want to just remind you that he is there. You might be wondering, well, then why don't I hear him speak to me? Maybe for you, God's voice is muted and maybe it's been a long time. And for some of you, maybe you've never 
felt like you've had a connection with God. And that's why we're on tonight, to talk about that. Uh, There are so many competing voices in the world right now, aren't there? Uh, Whether it be media or, I know, obviously with the state of the world, there's people probably spending a little bit more time on social media than they usually maybe do. So maybe it's the, the, the media outlets or just the, the friends and the network that we have and all the memes and videos and opinions that get shared. Uh, there are also voices that speak to us that are not friendly. They come from our enemy. They come from fear. They come from condemnation. They come from the devil himself. And here is the Lord trying to connect with us in this still small voice that he refers to in in 1 Kings 19. And he's got some competition for our attention, doesn't he? Uh, But it's interesting how every voice that comes to us wants to take charge and control and have the reins of our attention and really our belief and trust and hope. And so what we've got to do is we've got to turn the other competing voices down, don't we? We talked about that a couple weeks ago, how that we need to look for the voice of God, not just in the loud things, but we've got to find the time and the place where we can do some meditating, we can get alone and we can just be quiet. We can be alone with our thoughts and alone with the Lord and turn the other competing voices down and let him speak, whether he whispers or speaks boldly, let him speak to us. One of the unique blessings of of this time that we're in, and you might say, well, that's another bizarre word to use in regard to the coronavirus outbreak, but one of the unique blessings that we have in this time is that while there are not while there is not this ability to gather and to to fill the 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 empty, loud uh, voids of our life, uh, the spaces and the times that we we'll usually just go connect with friends or even go to church and just be uplifted by other people who are hearing from God and other people who have a healthy, vibrant walk with the Lord and just be edified and built up by them. There's this, there's this, this gap. There's this cavernous uh, void. We have time and we're alone with our thoughts more than we usually are. And one of the unique blessings about this time is that we get a chance to really get a view of the clear picture of the relationship that we have with the Lord, the condition that it's in, uh, the vitality that's there. Sometimes we can go to church and be uplifted by inspiring worship and be around encouraging people, but really, other than just being emotionally stirred, not much really took place in our life. We didn't directly, specifically hear from God and we haven't taken steps forward as a result of that. And so this is, uh, you know, kind of, this season has kind of pulled the Band-Aid off, if you will. And it's just raw. And some of you <laughs> who've been with your family for multiple days now, you've been quarantined in the same house. And I know we got to go out for groceries and the other things. And some of you men, if you're like me, you're doing some home improvement projects and all that. Maybe you're busy with other things, but you're with your family a lot. And it's been funny to see some of these memes about everybody kind of losing their mind because they're, they're, uh, they're stuck in the four walls of their house with, with their kids, you know, and their kids are on their uh, 10,000th chance now, uh, their, last, their last chance uh, before mom and dad uh, bring down the hammer or whatever. And that's been interesting in the dynamic of our family too, just being around one another more. And what a blessing that's been. What a gift that is. But also you get to kind of see things for what they are and you think, wow, there's some breakdowns in our relationships and wow, I've got some work to do. And so we can look at our relationship with the Lord in the same way. And so for those of you that say, man, it's been a long time or maybe, you know, I I don't know if I've ever heard the Lord speak to me. I want to put some things out there for you to consider tonight for just a minute. And, And that is this, you know, the connection that we have with the Lord that we've been given by his spirit, uh, and ultimately through Jesus Christ as he's given us access to the Father. The connection is probably bad if there's a breakdown, if there's a, if there's a lack of communication. The connection is most likely bad on our end. Uh, I can confirm without a shadow of a doubt, it is bad on our end. It's never bad on his end. You say, what do you mean by that? 
Well, the encouraging news tonight is this. If there's something between you and the Lord, and you know if there's any uh, break of communication between you and your Heavenly Father, you know, ultimately it's because we've allowed something to come between us and Him. Uh, Maybe that's where you find yourself tonight. But the encouraging thing that I find in James chapter number four, this is in the New Testament of the Bible, James chapter number four, is this promise that if I, I feel that I can't connect with God, if I feel that I'm far from him, the ball's in my court, so to speak. And he says in James chapter four, verse eight, that if I draw nigh to God, I've got a promise that he will draw nigh to me. And so however far I feel I am from the Lord, the Bible promises me that if I will take a step toward him, that while I'm taking that step, he will take a step towards me. And again, we know that God is not far. It's just our perception. But for those of us that think, man, I have a hard time believing that. It just seems that God is far. Let me just encourage you tonight and remind you that the Lord has, a and the creator of the universe, the one who uh, formed you from the dust of the ground and who, who, who knows the number of hairs that are on your head, the God who is in control of everything seen and unseen tonight. Let me just encourage you that he has a wider stride than you do. And he can cover a lot more ground in one step than you can. And you are never farther than just one step away from God. Drawing nigh to him comes with the promise that he will draw nigh to us. So if we go on in James chapter number four, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So God says, if you can't hear me, I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to identify some things that might be between you and I, and he lays it out for us. So what are these things? Okay, so first of all, I need to turn to God. I need to draw nigh to him. Then I need to cleanse my hands. And he, it's a bold statement. He says, ye sinners. I'm reminded of what Psalm 66 says, that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, we know that Jesus Christ ultimately has taken our sin and he's nailed it to the cross. And it, it, is, it no longer stands between us and God. But each and every day I'm faced with that choice to honor the Lord or to pursue my fleshly desires and get my hands dirty with things and my heart dirty with things that don't honor the Lord. And there can be something between me and the Lord that James calls sin. So he says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This speaks to the reality that I'm trying to serve myself and I'm trying to serve God. It's impossible to do both. I can't live for myself. I can't please myself. I can't do just what I feel like doing. And also live a surrendered life uh, to God. James is uh, writing here to the Jews and originally, and these Jewish readers who are reading this, who'd grown up under the law, these, these commands to cleanse your hands and to purify your hearts, these would have called to mind some of the ceremonial washings. The idea here is that they were supposed to completely turn from their sin and resolve um, that they would serve God again. And really, this is a beautiful picture of what repentance looks like. When I come to the end of myself, when I realize that I can't approach God, I can't have access to God, I, I can't save myself except by accepting what Jesus Christ has already done and turning from my sin. So that's one of the things that you could do tonight if you're not hearing the voice of God. You can cleanse your hands, the things that you know are wrong, the things that are written on the table of your heart that you know don't please God. Uh, push those things aside. James goes on and says this, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Verse number 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You know, there's nothing worse that God despises than a proud and arrogant heart. Now, it's easy to identify what we might perceive as an arrogant person, maybe a person who is blustery or is materialistic or uh, is narcissistic. 
we think, okay, that's a prideful person and I can obviously do my best to not be like that. But it go, pride goes so much deeper into the heart and it hides in the dark places, the crevices of our heart because ultimately each breath that we take uh, in which we do not acknowledge our need and our dependence upon God is an arrogant way to live. Each thing that I do thinking that I have the capacity and the capability to do it without God's help, it's really pretty arrogant. Uh, 2 Corinthians encourages, is, encourages us that we shouldn't think anything of ourselves because our sufficiency is of God. And so let me, let me bring this together tonight. You say, Pastor John, it's been a while since I've heard God speak to me. Well, perhaps there's some sin in your life Perhaps there's some some dirt. Perhaps your heart is pursuing things other than the Lord. And perhaps you're living each moment of your life in passive arrogance to God in the fact that you're not acknowledging Him as your source of strength and as your source of peace and your source for, for life itself. One pastor this week as I was reading said this, there's four things that you'll need if you want to hear the voice of God speak in your life. He said, number one, you need a redeemed soul. The Lord speaks to those that are his sons and daughters, his children who've been born again, who've come to faith in Jesus Christ. You'll need a surrendered life, a yielded spirit, and a clean heart. And that resonated for me. Now, I want to remind you that you may not feel that the Lord is near. We talked about that at the start tonight. But you know, there are times in our life when we don't have the answers we're looking for. There are times in our life when we simply must trust that though God is silent, God is still working. And I, f I find that to be the case as I look around our world tonight on April 7th, 2020. There's a lot of things that are out of our control that we wish we had answers to. This coronavirus and many others. And I want to promise you tonight that God is working. God is sustaining people and providing strength and peace and comfort. I think of our first responders and the nurses and doctors, those people that are on the front lines and those people who are suffering in ways that we are not. I want to promise you that the Lord is nigh unto them and is working his grace and goodness in their life, just like he's working it in our lives. But we all face that fearful time in our life where we, though God is silent, begin to doubt perhaps his presence. And in 1 John, it speaks to this. This is in the New Testament, 1 John 3. The Bible says, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. And so here's how we know that we've been born into the family of God, that we're the children of the truth, God's truth. Verse number 20 says, for if our heart condemn us, wow, this is powerful, then God is greater than, than our heart and knoweth all things. Have you ever been in that place in your life where your heart condemned you? Maybe you listened to a voice of condemnation to you that said, uh, you're insignificant, you're insufficient, you're not good enough, you are the problem. How could you possibly, how could God possibly love you uh, when you know all the things about yourself that you know that you've done that no one else knows? And these voices that barrage us. And, 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 the word is speaking to us tonight in First John chapter 3 that though our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have this confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. And so we've got to come to the place that even if we feel, even if our heart condemns, even if our emotions overwhelm, even if fear is the voice that we listen to, we've just got to trust that God is greater than our hearts. God is is nigh unto us. God is hearing our prayers. If, if we have a humble heart before him and our hands and hearts are cleansed and that we look around the world and we can't visibly see God moving, we have the promise that he is. So tonight, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about 
some of the things that you can do if you don't hear the voice of God speaking in your life. And I just wanna encourage you, come to him, bring your sin to him. He knows it's there anyway. And just say, Lord, you know this is here. I know this is here. Will you please take this from me? And then humbling ourselves before him, not just uh, doing away with the frivolities and the material, materialistic things of life, but also just in the moment acknowledging, Lord, I know that I can't take this breath without you. Lord, I know that you are the source of my strength. And so I'm not gonna be so bold and belligerent as to believe that I have anything to do with this. I know you do. Amazing, I think you'll find that if you implement a couple of these things, you might begin to see how that your heart has been softened and how that perhaps the voice of God becomes a little bit louder, a little bit more uh, clear in your life. I wanna leave you with this. I, I saw this this week. This is a pastor that I've got a lot of respect for. He said, here are seven ways to test what you are hearing to discern if it's the voice of God. These are not mine, but I wanna share them with you. He says, if you're hearing it, here's how you discern if it's the voice of God. Seven things. Number one, does it agree with the Bible? Is it consistent with the written word of God? We talked a lot about that in the last couple of weeks. Number two, does it make me more like Christ? Or does it simply give me what I think I want? It's amazing. Sometimes we ask the Lord for things that we think we need. And ultimately, if we run them through the filter of them being truly things that make us more Christ-like, wow, they don't really fit in, do they? He says, number three, does what I'm hearing, does my church family confirm it? Or does it go against what my group of counselors and advisors, maybe my friends that know me best, that study the Bible with me, my small group, the people that God's placed around me that are part of my family of faith, uh, does it go against what they say? You know, the people that know you know what your strengths are, your weaknesses are, and they can see how God's working in your life. And we all ought to have a group of counselors and friends that uh, we run things past. He says, number four, is it consistent with how God shaped me? And what he means by this is, is this consistent with who I know God made me to be? Can I do this well? Uh, while I'm being who I am, using my gifts, using my experiences, is this something that God can use me to do. He says, next, does it concern my responsibility or does it align with the mission that I know that I am called to as a child of God? So as we're hearing these voices speak into our life and should we listen to them? Should we, should we do these things? Should we live them out? I'm, we're running them through these filters. He says this, number six, is it convicting or is it condemning? In other words, is it condescending or is it rooted in love? You know, when the devil speaks to us, often when God speaks to us, the devil is quick to throw in his opinion also. And we can always discern if it's the voice of God because if it's condescending and it points a finger at us, we know it's not the voice of God. But if it's rooted in love and if it's, if it's as though it's coming from our Abba Father and it sort of inspires us to rise to the occasion to who we are in Christ, then there's a pretty good chance it's the voice of God speaking it into our life. And he says last, do I sense God's peace about it? Or am I conflicted or anxious? Or do I sense some resistance in my spirit about it? So I don't know what God's speaking to you. I don't know what he's sh sharing with you and revealing to you. But if you run it through these filters, and I know we went through them fast. Maybe you can come back through and watch the video later. These are, these are awesome ways, and I sort of processed this, this this week. These are awesome ways for me to identify if it's God speaking to me or if you, these are just voices of fear and condemnation and the devil himself trying to derail me. I wanna leave you with this verse, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. God says to us, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. I will hear you, he says. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all your heart. My friends, we don't have to wonder tonight how God feels about us. We don't have to wonder what his plans are for us. They are good plans. They are gracious plans. They are full of blessings and peace. And we walk through difficult days as we are tonight. But I wanna encourage you that God is near unto you. He desires to build you up and lift you up by his presence, by the comfort of his voice. 
And he wants to not only speak peace and strength and comfort, but he also wants to guide you. So I want to challenge you as you're hearing these voices and trying to discern whether it's the voice of God and what you should do. Run it through this filter we talked about. Surrender yourself to it. Let the Lord use you. I love the verse Christina shared here, Romans 8. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. So you might feel isolated at home. You've been in the four walls of your house for way too many days. But not even the four walls of your house can separate you from the love of God. Not even the four walls of your house can separate you from God's plan for your life. So as we've talked the last three weeks about how important it is that we hear the voice of God, number one, let's be silent and listen for it. Let's, let's identify how God speaks it into our life as we talked about last week. And then maybe we can look into our own heart and say, Lord, there are some things in my heart that I know are prohibiting me from hearing from you. And I wanna bring them to you tonight and I wanna hear you speak. I pray, my friends, dear brothers and sisters, children of God, I pray that you know the voice of God. I pray that you hear it, that he speaks into your life today and in the days ahead. Let's pray and we'll wind it down tonight. Father God, we come to you. We acknowledge our need of you. We humbly, Lord, truly bow before you, knowing that you are the source of our strength. I wanna pray for every person who's listening to this tonight at this moment and for those, Lord, that may hear it in the near future. I pray that perhaps one of the things that was said tonight or maybe a few would help them to more clearly discern and to hear your voice. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to hear. I pray that you'd speak into our lives. We need you, Lord. What an uncertain time. But in the midst of it, you have a plan for us. You have purposes for us. And we desire to be a part of that plan. So tonight, we ask for your grace and strength. I pray for our world, our country, our community, our friends, those that are suffering with the virus, those who have needs because their job has been lost or their hours have been cut back at work or whatever way that their needs have been cut short. Would you help us as the family of God to meet those needs? And Lord, in a way that only you can, would you intervene in their life, meet their needs on their behalf? We love you, Lord. We trust you. We know that you're in control. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, everybody. See you this Sunday, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., howlchurch.org forward slash live for Easter worship. Good night.